Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the CAGS lecture. My name is David Urbach, and as the president of the Canadian Association of General Surgeons, it brings me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Caroline Moulton, who will deliver the CAGS lecture. And I'd like to also express my appreciation and gratitude to SAGES and their partnership with us in CAGS uh, for allowing us to have this lecture today. Uh, Caroline graduated from the University of Melbourne in 1992 and was certified in general surgery by the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons in 2001. She undertook several fellowships following this, uh, upper gastrointestinal and laparoscopic surgery in St. Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne, and a fellowship in HPB surgery at Toronto General Hospital, as well as a medical education fellowship at the University of Toronto. She completed a PhD in health professions education in 2010. As a scientist at the Wilson Center for Research and Education in Toronto, Dr. Moulton's qualitative research initiatives focus on cognition, culture, and competence in surgery, with particular interest in surgeon stress and wellness. Her research seeks to understand the complexity of surgical judgment, the development of surgical expertise, and underlying causes of surgeon error. In 2017, she entered a multi-year partnership with international hepatobiliary associations to translate her slowing down framework into an online educational resource for surgical trainees in HPB surgery around the world. Dr. Moulton exemplifies the thoughtfulness and creative thinking that we value in Canadian surgery, and her career really parallels the mission of the Canadian Association of General Surgeons, which is to empower general surgeons to improve patients' lives through advocacy, education, and research. She is also, uh, on the personal side, a good friend whose humor, warmth, and commitment to her patients and colleagues uh, is always appreciated. Uh, we do uh, work together in Toronto, and um, uh, I'm sure you're all going to uh, be very impressed uh, by the lecture today, although Caroline did tell me not to raise expectations too high uh, because this is the first time she's delivering this particular lecture. Uh, so please all join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Caroline Moulton. Thank you, David, and thanks for the invitation to come and share the, um, the work that I've become passionate about over the last several years. I, um, it is the first time I've given uh, kind of the end of this lecture. I'm going to summarize uh, for you, um, I think, a growing theory of what I am looking at as surgeon excellence or surgeon expertise um, and trying to understand the kind of the various layers that I've become interested in uh, and how do we actually understand surgeon expertise. And I think the final layer, maybe not the final layer, but one of the layers um, that I've been exploring recently uh, has been the uh, surgeon as a team member and what the team, uh, surgical team is all about. Um, I really have focused for the last decade on an understanding of surgeon judgment and surgeon uh, expertise. And I've really enjoyed focusing on the surgeon, looking at what's inside the surgeon's head, um, how, is, how is the surgeon influenced. Um, that has been kind of my focus, looking at the individual. And I've really resisted, I think, uh, trying to get too involved in this kind of growing uh, interest in teams or teamwork, um, and also a growing interest in checklists and handoff tools. I never really understood what I felt about them. I knew they kind of irritated me, and I didn't really understand why. Um, and so what I've decided uh, recently, um, not really kind of my choice, but as recently becoming the medical director of the operating room, um, our surgeon in chief came up to me several years ago and said, uh, I had an incident in the OR the other day. Uh, something happened at handoff, the, the anesthetic handoff. Uh, I think if we were involved in that handoff, that wouldn't have happened. Uh, and I'd like you to see if you can create some uh, handoff tools that we can actually use for the various disciplines within the OR. Um, and I kind of took a deep breath and I thought, you know, creating a checklist, uh, how much time is this going to take, um, probably no resources, and um, not sure that it's going to really be that successful. But soon after that conversation that I had with him, I actually was doing a Klatskin tumor um, myself, and I had to actually get home, and this was pre-organized, that I had an important event at home to get to. Um, and so around 6.30, I had planned someone to come in and take over the case just in case I hadn't finished uh, the operation. And I remember when he came in, um, we kind of quickly had a chat. Um, 
I told them basically what we were up to. The fellow was remaining, and I there was no formal handoff. Uh, I just the the surgeon had known the case uh, from CTs previously, and I basically uh, took off and uh, started driving home. And I was on the DVP heading home, uh, and I remembered that the patient had two ducks to sew to, not one. And I didn't hand that off. And I know the fellow was there when I was cutting across the bile duct, and I thought, well, the fellow should know uh, that the, the patient has two ducks, and when they're doing the reconstruction, everything will be fine. Uh, but I thought, you know, I should just call in anyway and just make sure that they found there, that there was two ducks to sew to. And uh, sure enough, uh, they were just sewing up, and they were um, sewing the patient's abdomen up. And uh, unfortunately, they, they only had found one duct, and they, were, they had just done the one single hepaticojejunostomy. And so they had to open up the patient again and uh, complete the second. And I remember um, with my kind of a little bit, I guess, arrogance or my surgical approach to um, being, t being told to create this handoff tool, uh, I thought um, to myself, if I had taken, if I had used a handoff tool, um, and more importantly, if I had actually taken it seriously and really engaged in the process and believed in the process, I wonder whether uh, this item here in the checklist reminders would have flagged my memory aid uh, to, to remember to kind of hand off that there was two docs. I, I suspect it would have. Um, now, the handoff tool, as I've come to learn, is not the be-all and end-all. It's an aid. Um, and there's a checklist component with a handoff component to it, but there's also other items. Um, eventually, we created handoff tools for every discipline, and there's other items uh, that, were, that we were particularly proud of in putting in place uh, to try to draw attention to the lack, sometimes, of the communication aspect of um, the, the operating room. So I want to create for you um, the layering of the excellent surgeon and trying to understand when we talk about an excellent surgeon or we talk about surgical competence or surgical excellence, what is it that we should be thinking about uh, and what is it that we should be teaching and, and how should we be reflecting on our own uh, performance? Obviously at the base of um, excellence in surgery is technical skill. Uh, recently, um, Berkmeyer showed that if you uh, looked at surgeons' performance uh, while they actually are operating, you can actually see that, um, hang on one second, you can actually see differences and use global rating scales to actually identify good performers and poor performers. And Brookmeyer was the first one uh, to show that this actually had an impact on long-term outcome which I think is actually fantastic in a way that we can actually start taking our technical skills more seriously and trying to seek feedback and trying to understand how we might actually be better and improve our own technical performance at no matter at any stage of our career. Unfortunately, again, coming back to the culture idea, uh, and this is kind of constantly a mixture between cognition and culture, I think. Um, that we, al we also did a study on coaching in the uh, surgical world in our, pr in our hospital. And we found that even though surgeons thought that coaching was a great idea, and even though they thought that they could use coaching, many of them were actually reaching a part in their career uh, where they actually may be plateauing and would like to actually invest a little bit more effort in becoming better. Uh, unfortunately, the culture uh, got in the way. Uh, and largely it's around reputation and largely around this idea of our own image and what do people think about us and what will people say about us. There would be a high risk of it having negative perceptions by people, so whether it's nurses, residents, fellows, I think it would be perceived as either a sign of weakness or a sign of inability or a sign of lack of confidence because it's not the norm. You're supposed to be the big dog expert, and so I think it takes a lot of pride swallowing to the next day have a coach come in and critique you openly in front of people, and then the day after that you are, you are back to being the only one in the room, and you need everyone to take you just as seriously and with as much respect as they took you the day before. 
Now, fortunately, um, some groups are actually making inroads to coaching, um, but they often are getting around this idea of having a coach in your room and trying to get around this idea of image by taking the coach out of the room. And whether it's with uh, tele uh, telecoaching, like uh, Alan is being involved with, or um, with Greenberg and the Wisconsin group, having uh, coaches outside of the operating room after the fact, I think we also can't get past the idea that the reason why we don't have a coach in the room, like many other uh, ath athletes have, and probably what would be the best for us is to have a coach in the room to see the nuances, particularly of open surgery, is because we're, f we're afraid of our image. And it, it became ironic, or just to start thinking about this as we were talking to surgeons, that the reason why we're not improving is because we're worried about um, appearing like we're not good enough. And so we're preventing ourselves from getting good enough because of the, the concern about the image. And this is the, um, one, the first slide of many slides that, that I've labeled choice. Because I think as I've done this work, I've started appreciating that there are choices that we make uh, as we are a surgeon and through our surgical career about where we might actually be more excellent and where we might stay mediocre. Um, and I'm by no means saying that I'm excellent. I think I'm in, on this journey with everybody trying to understand what it's all about. Um, and so I think this, this idea of choice uh, has to kind of come up here to say that we could be better technically if we actually just got over ourselves and started actually appreciating that we can learn from other people. The second layer of um, expertise, I think, is cognition. We all know that technical expertise is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Um, that it also is important to think about what is in the head of the surgeon. Uh, and we bring judgment with us uh, in our heads through our experience um, and through our training. I became uh, quite fascinated by a phenomenon that we labeled slowing down when you should. Uh, some of you may have heard this work. Um, it's really about a transition that happens when we are in our relatively routine mode and then recognize that something's um, not quite right, uh, that there's a critical moment in the surgery, that something looks um, uh, out of place uh, or you're a little bit uncertain uh, and you slow down when you should. And some of these slowing down moments are actually planned and some of them are unplanned and hopefully a lot of them are planned. Um, but some of them are actually unplanned. And we looked at other literatures to try to help us understand what this uh, slowing down phenomenon was about. Because we really thought that this was a hallmark of expertise and, and expert judgment. And we wanted to understand um, what other literatures might inform the way we think. We're human after all, and other people have studied the way the brain thinks. So I was able to look in other literatures and really bring out um, some theories from the cognitive literature that might inform the way we think. And I'll just share a couple of those with you today. One of them is the idea that we have a fixed cognitive capacity, that we can pay attention to things, but we can't, we can't over-task um, ourselves. And if we actually are going above a th certain threshold, like the dotted line there, uh, you're outside of the box. You can multitask within that box, but you can't actually go outside of that box. Otherwise, you're taking attention from somebody else or something else uh, that you're actually doing. And as you become an expert, you automate a lot of the stuff that you're doing. And so as you become, you're going from a PGY-1 to a PGY-5, the effort and the attention that was required to sew up a wound becomes less and less. Uh, and so you can actually have a conversation with them uh, as they are now on the, on, relatively on the right-hand side, freed up cognitive resources, you can have a conversation with them, whereas uh, PGY-1 may have actually stopped what they were doing to answer your question. And so this understanding of cognition and the fact that we have a limited amount of cognition that we have to attend to things is an important part of actually surgery and surgical judgment within the operating room. Another theory that I think is actually very important is this idea of situation awareness and understanding what is in your environment at any given time and place. Uh, and, and particularly in the ability to slow down, to appreciate and understand uh, the cues that are in your environment that might make you want to slow down. Uh, or as some describe a top-down situation awareness where you actually know that there's something that potentially could be in this place, the ureter is somewhere around here, and now we're looking uh, to try to perceive the cue. Uh, and so we have kind of constantly, or we're trying and attempting as an expert surgeon to try to maintain situation awareness in the operating room. 
But, but again, we know that expertise is more than just developing automaticity, that we also have to be cognitively aware and leaving some of that cognitive capacity to attend to things that may not actually be screaming at us uh, and to be thinking about things that are not actually automatic. Donald Schoen talks about this reflective cycle uh, where he says that a lot of, a lot of the times when he, when he observed um, experts in their domain, so he did observe medical professionals in their environment, um, a lot of the um, knowledge or talk that they, that they had was around this kind of routine talk. So I saw a patient, he has appendicitis, didn't have to think too much about it. Um, this patient has uh, diverticulitis, this patient needs to go to the OR, this one doesn't. Some, some of that and a lot of that is actually routine the more, more senior we become. Um, but every now and again we have to slow down and transition into a reflection in action and think of our feet, think on our feet, um, recognizing that the decisions that you're making now uh, will, will affect the patient in that moment. So, so bailing through into the wrong plane or clipping kind of carelessly uh, a structure when you're doing a lap coli and finding out that it's the duct uh, and not being aware of your internal cues or external cues about where, where the, the fact that you might be lost is obviously not part of expertise. But I put also up this, um, this cycle because reflection on action uh, is often what we think about when we say reflection is we leave the case and we think back on the case um, when, we've gone, when we've left the room. And this is often what we'd call as the debrief in our, um, in our surgical safety checklist. And the ability that as a team or as an individual, uh, you can engage in this this um, reflection on action so that we build awareness and we build knowledge and wisdom into our systems or our teams and it helps us for the next case. And I think one of the things you can see when you're actually, um, when you flip the graphs now, you're an expert on the left-hand side. I can actually be uh, doing a Whipple now after 10 years of doing Whipples and it's in a relative, I can stay in a fairly rel uh, um, routine mode. It sounds weird uh, for me when I was younger, I would have said there's no way I would be in a routine mode doing a Whipple, but you can actually stay in a routine mode doing a Whipple if you've done enough of them. Uh, and so every now and again, you have to transition to focus on what you need to focus on to avoid trouble. And the blue box there shows you that you can actually see this or witness this and start to understand the telling signs of people that you're operating with. Um, and, we, and you can also feel this kind of transition in yourself once you become aware of the slowing down phenomenon. And I, when we looked at this in the operating room and I put this up because I think um, what I've started understanding, appreciating is that one of the manifestations of slowing down in the operating room is removing distractions. And sometimes that requires, uh, or surgeons kind of don't really know how they're feeling and don't really get the fact that they're stressed. And they might say something rudely, like take the conversation outside. Uh, they in the past may have sworn or thrown things, um, but I think it was probably a reflection of them actually transitioning into the state and not really being aware of what was happening to them. Uh, because we don't talk about it, we don't make it explicit. When things are going smoothly, you hardly notice it, and when things get a little rough in there, you notice it much more. The anesthetist doesn't realize what's going on, and they're still nattering away about what the raptors did last night. So I usually have to just tell them, hold it a minute here until I see what we're doing with this. And as we start to think about um, teams and team functioning, as we start to kind of lift our um, focus from being uh, primarily what is in our surgical field to a true expert, which is understanding what's going on around us and actually maybe being a, a good leader of a team and understanding what that actually means, we can start to appreciate that there are nurses that have slowing down moments, uh, perhaps when they're counting. Um, and we, in our arrogant way, I think sometimes say that's not important. What is important is you hand me that forcep. Now, occasionally, it is important that you ha get handed a forcep, and occasionally it is that they're counting in a time that perhaps is not appropriate, but that's also what's, what part of teamwork. Um, and so a good leader might actually notice that the, the nurse is counting, and it, and it is a very important part because her cognition is limited, and we don't want a bad count, or we don't want an inappropriate count, and we should be encouraging that nurse to be able to count without being interrupted. But that's like a big deal for nurses to ask for that from us. And I only know that because of the medical director role, that there's a, there's a, a disconnect between, I think, what nurses would like to see us and how, how they'd like to see us actually behave uh, or appreciate some of the things that they're actually doing. 
One of the other um, concepts, I think, also that we can start relating to this idea of team is the fact that we can be in a relatively routine mode. So surgeons can actually be in a relatively routine mode, but they can, they can choose, and here it comes back to choice again, whether you stay attentive in that routine mode or whether you actually can slip off in, into an inattentive mode. Uh, and I saw this when we, were opera when we were watching surgeons and we labeled this drifting. It's the routine cases, that's what happened here. It was an easy case, we were chatting and obviously not being as diligent as we should have been. And I think sometimes we feel pressure to um, appease the juniors or to entertain sometimes when we're operating, that we actually want to them to come and have a good experience. Um, I think sometimes we can do that, but I think there are other times we have to re reserve some of that cognition um, off the top to actually reinvest back into our case uh, to ask questions like, am I in the right plane? Is this, a, is this what we should be doing? And not get in distracted and kind of find yourself down the wrong plane and saying to yourself, I can't believe I just did that, which is often what we say at the end of it. And this leads me to this idea of a mindful surgeon. And I think recently thinking about mindful teams, what does a mindful team look like? And shouldn't that be what we're actually striving for? Where we actually get cognizant of everybody's slowing down moments, cognizant of everybody, where, where everybody needs, uh, needs some space um, and cognizant that we need to reserve some cognitive capacity to attend to the things that we're doing so we don't make mistakes. And again, this idea of choice comes back to it. We can choose to what we do with our spare capacity. We can talk about the movies last night, which, is, which might be fine. We can listen to music, which might be fine, but it also might not be fine. Um, and it might be fine for you, but it might not be fine for your nurse or the nursing student who's, who's diligently trying to kind of listen to you and try to, try to keep up. The other layer that we have on us is not just the cognition and not just what's in our heads, but the fact that we are individuals embedded in a very powerful social setting. Um, and so this is, uh, this quote, my efforts during these moments of crisis, so he's talking about slowing down moments, were consumed with the anxiety I was feeling and intermixed with feelings of inadequacy, uncertainty, reputation, and ego. So we've also started understanding and trying to appreciate this idea of the emotional surgeon. And, and what does the emotional surgeon uh, do? What, do? what is it, how do we actually respond? And can we actually train ourselves to respond any differently? I had a master's student, Natasha, uh, look at the relationship between physiologic stress and perceived stress. So in other words, it, when we are stressed, do we actually know that we're stressed? And one thing that became very clear about this is that we often didn't know that we were stressed. And so some, some of us are actually very good at perceiving that we're stressed and others are not very good at it at all. Um, but I think also there's, there's um, the ability to uh, start to learn about stress patterns in surgeons and, and start to learn about your own stress pattern, not to kind of shove it under the carpet because we don't want to talk about it. Sometimes stress and your reaction to stress affects your patients, uh, and sometimes it affects your wellness. And so we need to start understanding how we can dig deeper into the reactions um, of surgeons and how we might be able to understand surgeon stress better. It's complicated, I haven't figured it out yet, but we're still trying. And again, coming down to the idea of choice. We don't have to not talk about this. You know, we don't have to pretend that we're, we're um, you know, invul invulnerable. Um, we can actually choose to actually talk about it and start to say, okay, I was stressed, my hand shakes, that really sucks. I kind of need someone to come in and, or I needed someone to come in and, and I could not sew that vein. It required kind of precision and I just couldn't. Even after the fact, when, when I wasn't stressed anymore, the shakiness remains. And I think all of us have felt that. You know, we need to start talking about it and understanding it. And maybe through biofeedback, we could actually be better. And then, and then the final thing, which is what I've kind of been touch, touching about, is this idea of sociocultural surgeon and understanding that we are, again, surgeons that are embedded in a team. And we can keep zooming in on our surgical field, which is what I wanted to do when I was trying to understand surgical excellence. But more and more, as a medical director, I hear stories of, of um, incidents, critical incidents that happen um, wrong site surgery, you know, miscommunication errors, telling people information that were observers in the OR, not anesthetists. Um, these kind of things are happening because we actually don't know our teams and because we actually aren't taking this role seriously. One thing that we are, that we are is totally busy. 
and always pressured by the clock. I don't think I heard a surgeon not say this. I think the pressure of the clock is distracting and you hurry things along. We know that it's the wrong thing to operate by the clock, but we're put in a position where we're in some ways forced to do that. So we know that the environment is going to affect us. We know that the environment is going to affect our patients. We continue to do it. The organization has to be responsible and accountable for what they do to us. Um, but also we have to understand what we do uh, ourselves. You know, when I'm asked to take on the next job, if Alan says to me, do you want to take on this job, um, you know, as the head of whatever, uh, I have to start saying to myself, I can't keep, I can't keep taking on. I'm, I'm not, you know, somebody who can just keep taking on. I'm going to crack eventually. And, and it might impact myself, it might impact my family, it might impact my, pati my patients. And so we have to start thinking about we're human, you know, and again, we can't keep taking on. We have to start understanding the, the relationship between environment and our decisions, uh, and sometimes the decisions that actually affect us. This theory of Goffman uh, called impression management has uh, become a favorite of mine, and I like to tell people about it because I think we're all um, a little bit vulnerable to this um, concept. This is the notion, um, Goffman was an anthropologist, a Canadian anthropologist actually, and he studied the way humans interacted together. So he was very uh, fascinated by the way one, one person would interact with another person. And he put up social experiments all over the place. Um, he, he'd put a uh, researcher on the train and he'd ask them to tell people to get up and let, them s let that researcher sit down. And he'd look at the responses that he gets from people. Um, but what he was, uh, what the, the theory that he created was this idea that we are all social actors. So no matter where we are, I'm social acting right now. Uh, when I go home, I'll be another social actor with my kids. Uh, different hats I'll be wearing, but I'm still kind of engaging in the social acting role. Whether I'm a mother or a surgeon or uh, a friend, I'm engaging in the social actor role. And we all care about the image and the impression that we put on people. And so we have to be, um, we all th are thinking about and cognizant of that front stage, he calls it the front stage, he uses the metaphor of theater, and he talks about that front stage or the way we actually act for people, but always being cognizant of our own backstage, and the fact that we have a backstage um, that may not always be aligned with the front stage. I remember if a urologist, a junior urologist, your urology resident coming in to try to save the day in my OR because no one could put the, the catheter in. And I remember him kind of, you know, it was the first few weeks of PGY1 and he was sent in. He was a big guy and he kind of, you know, sauntered in. Um, I could tell, and I think from my research, I could tell that he probably wasn't that confident, um, but he was acting confident. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I think we do sometimes have to act confident. I'm not saying that we don't. But I think we have to be explicit or we have to be aware of when we're putting on the act and when we can take it off. You know, if I am doing a meeting for my medical director role, I might have to put on an image. I might have to wear a suit that day. I might have to actually put out a front that day. But I also um, might not have to. I might have to do something different when I'm standing in a patient's room uh, who's dying you know, or teaching a resident uh, about uncertainty. You know, these are all things that are, that make us thoughtful and that make us excellent surgeons. And we don't have to be a victim to this culture that tells us we have to always portray this image of being certain and brave and fearless all the time. This is a surgeon who said, there are ones like, well, do I really need this help? Do I want to seem like a loser? Am I going to call someone? And I think we've all been in that situation where we think we should call someone. We kind of would, we do want help. You know, number one, we could, we could have someone come in and they might even teach us something. But sometimes we actually just need help. And this goes through our mind. Did I call for help? When was the last time I called for help? Who did I call for help? You know, can I call for help? Am I at the stage where I can call for help? Uh, and someone, one of the surgeons that I was interviewing talked about having this kind of threshold of being able to call for help. You should call for help. Uh, because that shows uh, humility, but you can't call for help too much, and you, so you, and you probably shouldn't call for help too little. So, you know, again, we're kind of, we're, we're using kind of freed up resources, we're wasting resources, cognitive resources, thinking about this when, when we should just say, okay, we should just call for help. So again, it comes back to the choice, and you can choose to be a victim to the culture, or you can choose to be an excellent surgeon and make the right choices for the patients. 
So now we have all of that going on and that's just the surgeon. So the surgeon represents one of these lines. And I know that, and as we started studying the teams and looking at nurses and anesthetists, they also have their own lines going on and they also have their own their own cognitive stuff going on, uh, paying attention to different things. Um, they're also worried about their image. Uh, they're also thinking about um, pressures and maybe getting home that night. And now we actually all come together as part of the team. And one of the things that uh, struck me was the, comp the complexity of that and how we kind of show up and we just start working and, um, and we think that that's okay. And it's a little bit odd to, th to think that that's just okay. And often the, the teams are ad hoc. They're people that you haven't worked with for a while, you don't remember their name. Um, and so th we kind of th throw ourselves together and say, okay, let's just work together. Um, so I'm gonna go back to the research that I was asked to do um, by my chief of surgery on handoff. And through the experience, I said to him, I can do the handoff project, but I'm not just gonna create tools. I have to understand why we're reluctant to checklists, handoff tools, safety initiatives. At the same time of our hospital was becoming an HRO or high, re high reliability organization. And there's all these safety initiatives that were happening. Uh, and I needed to understand, um, you know, why they weren't working or why is it so hard to get us to change behavior? So we struck a research team, um, one from every uh, discipline. This was the handoff project. We had two anthropologists. I'm, I'm um, privileged enough to, to work with two anthropologists um, in the Wilson Center. And we also had a medical student who was gonna do a lot of the grunt work for us over uh, a 20 month period. And our aim, aim was really to characterize the handoff. Because I said to the chief, you know, Schaff, I don't, I'm not gonna create a handoff tool if we don't need one, because we may not need one, and the people on the ground may not feel like we need one. So I will find out what is happening at the moment, um, who, how, how are handoffs being conducted, how long are they taking, what information is being passed, is there consistency, and do the groups themselves feel like they need actually a handoff tool? And we went in with this understanding of a theory called decoupling. And this is this, um, it's a very important theory, I think, in healthcare, uh, where we have to start understanding that just because you put a policy in place doesn't mean that you're gonna have the desired practice change. And from practice does not mean even if you, if you even if you get the practice to change, doesn't mean you're gonna have the, the um, the, out, the desired outcome. So you have to decouple this idea that practice is gonna lead to this outcome. And you have to start understanding why things get decoupled and why, think, why there's gaps in this line between policy and um, outcome. We had 68 observation days and 50 interviews of various members of the, of the surgical team. And what we started understanding was that there was um, assumptions that each one of us had about the other. And I think as I've started reflecting on it, I think we're, we're brought up in a very powerful, again, a very powerful culture, but so are nurses and so are anesthetists. And they have judgments, they make judgments about how we think and how we feel, and we make judgments about how they think or why they, why they did what they did. And so we're all kind of in this team, and this is why team is always kind of a foreign concept to me, because we don't really know the people we're in this team with, and we're almost competing with each other or almost kind of not liking each other um, because we actually are sitting there in judgment of one another. And one of the things that became obvious to me was that we make assumptions about um, each other and about the things that we, sometimes we do things because we assume the other group wants it or needs it. And this was uh, the case with the handoff, is that some of the nurses were not asking the, the surgeon um, or anesthetists were not asking the surgical team or surgeons were not asking the others whether this would be a good time to hand off. Um, and so the surgeons wanted that. They said, you know, it's not, sometimes not an appropriate time, uh, not just because I'm a prima donna, but because it sometimes isn't the right time to hand off. Uh, and sometimes nurses don't know it. But m many of the nurses that we interviewed thought that if you actually are a good nurse, you know when it's a good time to hand off. If you finish nursing, you wrote your exam, you passed, and you're a novice nurse, you still know when it's the appropriate time to hand off. And the surgeon would say, sometimes the nurses may not know that it's an inappropriate time. We may not say that the patient is bleeding. And so one of the things we put into the handoff tool that um, we were making was you, you, you ask, if, is this an appropriate time to hand off? Uh, 
The second thing was orient the incoming surgeon, or the we had one handoff tool for every discipline, but orient the incoming person to the team, which means you tell them who's in the room, because we've had many instances where uh, information has been given to people that have not been, should not have had that information. Um, uh, a perfusionist, as an example, told an anesthetic uh, an observer that they were going to keep some gas on, or the gas was on, and they were going for a break. And the anesthetist, who was an observer, not an anesthetist, said thank you and thought that he was getting getting taught something. And then the patient actually ended up in a cardiac case having the gas on uh, for a lot longer than expected. And it actually impacted the length of the case, and the patient was fine. But it's a mistake that probably shouldn't have happened. And other things happen like that. Sometimes we look around and we don't even know who's in our own OR room. I don't know if that's a good thing. I think we should actually start understanding who's actually in the OR room and who's who's around. Sometimes I look up at the 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 anesthetist and I don't know if that's an anesthetist or a fellow or a resident. And if I'm actually bleeding, you know, I don't know whether I should be challenging this person above me uh, to get help. If he's an anesthetist, maybe he's got it. You know, if he's a fellow or a resident, sometimes it's hard to tell. We have a big, we're working in a big place, and we don't always know the people uh, that are with us and part of the team. And I understand that that's not the, the case in many institutions, which is great. It's embarrassing to ask someone their name when they've worked with them for three years or more. Sometimes I just wait until someone else mentions their name. If they said, I'm sorry, I've worked with you, but I'm not good with names, can you tell me your name? I wouldn't be offended. I'd be happier you did that than just calling me nurse. So this is an interesting one because I still, even knowing this, I still can't tell, I, I still can't ask nurses. If I think I should know their name, I still don't ask them their name. Uh, and, and I think in many ways we have to build in, this is where maybe a top-down initiative would help. We build in a, an initiative where we actually maybe have to announce our names, like we, did, we would have to do if we took the checklist seriously or the briefing seriously. We'd be announcing our names and we wouldn't have to worry about who's who. Or maybe the system would say we should have names on caps or names you know, on whiteboards or some kind of system approach to understanding that there are actually issues with, with what's happening in the operating room. And then finally, for this project, it was introducing the incoming nurse to the team. Again, uh, when, when the handover actually took place, sometimes not always being the right time, the surgeon will be surprised because the scrub nurse has changed. And honestly, I think that's probably a fantastic turnover because they haven't even noticed. And some surgeons just said, that's just weird. It's actually important to know who's the nurse. The way I would interact with both my fellow resident and the scrub nurse will change when the scrub nurse changes, depending on who that scrub nurse is. It doesn't matter to them, surgeons, who's the face behind the pump. We want to know who they are, and that's unfortunate that they feel that way. I feel like I'm ignored, that I could just be a robot that you plug in and turn off when you're done with me. You lose that element of being a human being, and that really bothers me. I think sometimes we, we say, well, maybe that's just in their institution. You know, maybe they work in a really, it sounds like they really work in a bad place. I think until you actually start asking people who are sometimes under, under you in power, you may not know actually what they're saying. And so I think it's actually a little bit cocky and arrogant to think that the people in your institution are not actually saying the same kind of thing. So we created the handoff tools. They're pretty, they're beautiful. Are they being used? No. They're used by some, um, even though the group said that they wanted them. Are they being used? No. And so I actually also wanted to, and in a way I knew that they weren't gonna be used because I actually knew that change is hard and we hadn't really pushed it because I wanted to see as part of my research what was happening. You know, why aren't they actually being used? The same for the safety checklist. I know that we have 100% compliance, and actually every, every hospital in Ontario has 100% compliance for the safety checklist. But I also, through the research, see the way the safety checklist is being done. And I know that the how the safety checklist is being done and whether people show up engaged or not is also very different. And again, it comes back to the idea of is this important or not? Is this part of surgical expertise or not? Are, sh are we supposed to be focused just in our surgical field? And does it really matter about how we actually show up on the day? So the really the, pr the purpose of this study, and I'll just quickly go through again a couple of the assumptions that we uncovered with this study, was why do we roll our eyes when we talk about the checklist having 100% compliance? You know, in our institution, when we say we're 100% compliant, the surgeon will be like, 
you know, or anesthetist. We know it's not really, we're not really taking it that seriously, or not everybody is taking it that seriously. And we, we're ticking that we do the brief, the debrief, and the debrief every time. We don't do the debrief. We, we rarely saw a debrief being done uh, when we were observing. And so we're ticking these boxes that we're doing them, uh, but we're not. Is that because we shouldn't be doing them? Is that because these checklists are not important? That might be what David might say in your paper. You know, it's hard to know. It's, a, it's contentious, right? Like, is it actually being done? correctly, and if it is being done correctly and there's no outcome difference, then maybe they don't need to be done. But until we are doing them correctly, until we understand how they should be done qu correctly and why we're there, uh, we probably can't answer the question. If there is decoupling, if we're saying we're doing it and they're kind of doing it but there's no impact on performance, what's the, uh, what's the, what's the gap? Again, we went into the operating room. Um, and we saw similar assumptions, and I just want to kind of run through a few of them. The interchangeability and undervaluing of, this, of the self. Many staff leave the surgical safety checklist to the fellows who are winging it and leafing through the patient's chart at the last minute. It does not reflect ownership and can undermine the awake patient's confidence. The brief is conducted regularly, however, it is most often led by the surgical fellow, who often isn't knowledgeable about the details of the case, required equipment, sequence of events, etc. It would be valuable to have the staff surgeon for the briefing, especially in complex cases that are not considered routine. It doesn't matter if there's a briefing in our rooms, because the nursing staff frequently change before and during the case. Also, the anesthesiologist is frequently not present for the briefing, just the resident or fellow. If the only person that is present for the briefing and debrief, and the whole case is the surgeon, then what's the point? Another assumption of competing values. I think because, again, we've been brought up in different, uh, different ways and different value or education systems, we, we feel we actually want different things or, or value different things. It's really nice when they're friendly and caring. They'll come in, eye contact, they'll respond when you say, hi, my name is X, and they'll be great to have you on the team. How are you? A surgeon said to me, you know, we studied also the surgeon roles, and they talk about having to be collegial. Um, they're, they're, surgeons are actually um, trained to focus on competence. We, we value competence. We don't value collegiality. Uh, but it doesn't mean we can't be collegial. It doesn't mean we can't understand that nurses would like you to be collegial. We had a poster up on our board many, many years ago. It said, be nice. Whatever you do, be nice. And the surgeon said, why would you be nice? If someone's being incompetent, why would you be nice? I don't think it's that the nurses want us to be incompetent or want to be incompetent. I think it's, it's not that. And so I think that we have to start understanding where are some of the gaps and agitations that are happening in our, in our teams. Nurses judge basically just on vague externalities that have nothing to do with your competence. That's why it's so hard to worry about what people think about you. People judge you on crap. You know, people talk about being judged on how fast you were. If you can get in and out, you're a great surgeon, but maybe you're not. You know, so try to understand and feeling like actually you're constantly being judged. Everybody talks about teamwork, but at the end of the day, it's the surgeon who is going to be sued first. So even though it's a team, it's not a fully democratic team, in my opinion, nor should it be. However, if you want to get along with other people, you've got to act as though it is. It's kind of this idea of faking it. And is that, expert, is that expertise? Is that what we should be doing? Is there something wrong? I think we have to try to figure out what's actually going on. And this was an assumption of, of being judged. It was a horrible case and I couldn't identify the rectum. I couldn't even identify the sigmoid. So I'm operating with the senior resident and thinking to myself, I'm a colorectal staff and I can't even identify the rectum. I'm not saying it to anyone else in the operating room. I'm like, God, I'm like giving the perception that I can tell what's going on here. I think I must have spent a lot of time doing nothing. During that time in the OR, there's probably very minimal going on in terms of actual operative patient care. It was like taking care of myself. I had a student that um, was with me from France uh, for his, one of the years of his PhD, and he was interested in the way we plan for surgery. And he started talking to surgeons, neurosurgeons, about how they uh, conceptualize. We were interested in this idea of conceptualization of surgery and how they conceptualize surgery. And one of the things that occurred to me was that our, our concept or our conceptualization mentally changes 
from when we first get a referral to when we actually see patients in clinic and look at the scan to when we present the case at rounds. We can start changing the way we actually think about the case and then we show up in the operating room. And sometimes the information that the anesthetist give us or the nurse might give us might change the way we think about the case, how far we continue, how sick the patient is. That's what I think is the importance of the safety check, uh, the, the briefing the ability to actually all come together. And if you think of it as a cognitive construct, think of it as a team slowing down moment. It might actually make us get there. It might actually say, you know, what is that? It might be important to hear, and maybe even not uh, for me to hear what other people are saying, although I bet you you will learn things, but it might also be important for me to show what I what I'm about to do and the knowledge that I have, the conceptualize, conceptualizing the case to others. That might actually help the anesthetist know what, what's happening today. It might actually keep us engaged, make, make the nurse more engaged in the case, um, make, make the, the nurses have a more kind of um, um, uh, yeah, ownership of the case and learn from the case and, uh, and help in the long run. The, the other idea is this idea of situation awareness. If we see it as situation awareness, not just as an individual, but as a team, how do we actually maintain and attain situation awareness? It's by all getting together and sharing the awareness. It's not just assuming awareness. We're often not on the same page. And then if someone hands off, the same thing at a handoff, that person who knew everything has actually just left. And they have to actually hand off to the person who's coming in. So these are actually important. And if we see it like that, and you want to be an expert surgeon or an expert health professional, maybe we should be taking these things seriously. Again, the reflection on action. Maybe if we get better and think of taking the debrief seriously, maybe we can, if not us, maybe the nurse or the, the anesthetist can also learn how to actually do differently in the next case and make our lives easier. And maybe we will also learn something from the anesthetist uh, that will make us safer. So why do we roll our eyes at checklists? I really think it's because we don't value them. We don't think we need to do them. And we have autonomy, which is another issue. And again, another cultural issue. We actually feel like we don't have to, and we, get, we hate being told what to do. And I think the problem is until we actually own it and we actually realize that these are the things we need to start doing, and if we don't do it, somebody else will tell us how to do it. That's what's gonna happen, and that's what is, I think, is happening. So we can kind of stick with our narrow surgical field and you can walk in with your blinkers on and operate, uh, or you can actually take the challenge of being kind of an excellent surgeon um, and thinking about all of the different roles that you actually have. Again, it's choice. I think that's it. Thank you. Yes.